Good morning, everyone. Uh, I am, my name is Ho Chul Lee. Uh, I am teaching at Incheon National University. Uh, on my way to this conference, uh, I saw cherries just uh, began to blossom. So spring has come, even on the COVID-19. Uh, also, uh, I, as a former uh, president of this association of international, Korean Association of International Studies, uh, I express my great appreciation and encouragement uh, for this uh, new uh, president and uh, secretary general and uh, many, you know, uh, our association members uh, to devote uh, for the uh, association. I really appreciate. Uh, today, uh, uh, the association has uh, organized a very important uh, a conference on very a significant issue. Uh, the panel one will be about uh, North Korean nuclear issue uh, and, and uh, peace process on the Korean Peninsula under new administration of the United States, the Biden administration. Uh, we expect a, a lot you know, positive uh, changes. Also, we expect uh, some continuation from the previous uh, administration. Uh, 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 this panel, we have uh, two presenters uh, from United States. Uh, they are joining online uh, uh, because of the COVID-19. And also we have uh, uh, five uh, discussants. Uh, mostly from within uh, domestic Korea. Uh, by the way, uh, this conference, we are trying to our best to keep uh, COVID-19 quarantine uh, regulations. Uh, also, uh, because this is, uh, even the international conference, uh, most of you are online. Uh, the technical problems, I will check it uh, during my uh, moderation. Okay, uh, let me introduce uh, uh, two presenters uh, from the United States uh, uh, in the order of my program, program here. Uh, Ken Gauss uh, from the Navy, the Center for Navy Analysis. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me, Gauss? Ken Gauss, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, uh, all right. Uh, nice to see you. Uh, nice to see you too. All right. Uh, can you briefly introduce yourself to us? Uh, yes, I am the uh, director of the Adversary Analytics Program at CNA. Uh, we have a fairly substantial North Korea program as part of that. Uh, uh, program, a larger program that I run. Mm -hmm. And um, we basically study, uh, do studies for the U.S. government uh, on key adversaries around the world. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Ken. Uh, Bipin Narang from MIT, are you, are you here too? Hey Bipin Narang? Can you hear me? Can you, yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Hi, yeah, I'm uh, Professor Vipin Narang. Uh, I'm an associate professor of political science and member of the security studies program uh, at MIT. Uh, I wish I could be there in Seoul with everybody, mm. uh, but it's good to see everybody virtually online. Okay. Okay. Uh, nice to see you, Vipin. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, each of you, uh, I think about 20 minutes, uh, I ask you to present uh, about your topic. And then we have uh, five uh, discussants. Uh, each of your discussants, uh, uh, I ask you to discuss about seven minutes. That's going to be uh, first round of the presentation and discussions, okay? 
Uh, uh, let me go with first with uh, Ken Gauss from the Center of Navy Analysis. Uh, Ken Gauss, can you start, please? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I'm going to talk about the Biden administration uh, and its uh, North Korea strategy, which it's working on right now, uh, and talk a little bit about what I think uh, may be consistent with previous U.S. policy and what might be changing in the future. So I would say that the Biden administration is nearing completion of its policy review for the North Korea strategy. According to some people, this will probably take place uh, or complete wrap up somewhere within a month or maybe a little bit more. As the new administration in Washington finds its footing, patience in the region is, uh, is wearing thin. Uh, North Korea's recent short range missile tests uh, attest to this fact. The readout from the, the recent trip to Seoul by Secretary of State Blinken and Secretary of Defense Austin was very familiar in tone, signaled nothing really very much new that I could see, but instead a return to the kind of the familiar pre-Trump status quo. Hopefully this is not what we're going to get out of the policy review, but that's what we heard, we're hearing from some of the officials around uh, Biden at the moment. The Biden team must realize that a reprise of President Obama's wait and see approach will not work in my opinion. Even the Trump administration's headline grabbing threats and summits were a new packaging for a decades old approach of expecting Beijing to help put pressure on uh, Pyongyang to surrender its nuclear program. This policy line has failed time and time again. Uh, and North Korea's threatening capabilities continue to grow. The Biden administration should and can establish a more pragmatic, realistic policy uh, to urgently counter this threat that we see growing in the region. Uh, in addition to shoring up stability and providing deterrence to its uh, uh, deterrent umbrella, umbrella to its allies, uh, it should seek to foster a deeper, longer game of fundamental change inside North Korea. And this uh, means to avoid returning to strategic patience and instead re-engaging diplomatically, COVID, uh, COVID permitting, but this time with realistic goals attached to it. In other words, a pragmatic North Korea strategy that focuses on mitigating the consequences of North Korea's nuclear breakout while promoting long-term strategic change. That's kind of my overall takeaway about what's going on. In my comments today, I'll focus on three points. First, North Korea's calculus with regard to its nuclear program. Second, the Biden administration's likely strategy. And third, the contours of an effective North Korea strategy, in my opinion. So in terms of North Korea's calculus, the reason why U.S. policy toward North Korea has failed in the past is that it understandably starts from a point of view of what is best for U.S. national security. North Korea's national security and equities are of secondary or even tertiary importance, and for that reason, we struggle to come up with incentives and only focus on pressure. When we come up with the incentives, they are not very well defined. And they are always pitched as something to be given once North Korea makes tangible moves toward denuclearization. If we look at the situation from North Korea's point of view, and taking North Korea and Kim Jong-un's perspective and equities into account, some things become readily apparent. First, the nuclear program is intimately tied to the legitimacy of the Supreme Leader. Second, the program satisfies Kim's fundamental two objectives of regime survival and perpetuation of Kim family rule. Third, the Supreme Leader does not have a solid successes in other areas such as the economy, 
which can be used to offset the legitimacy conferred to him by the successes in the national security realm. Fourth, as the United States and the international community ratchet up the pressure through sanctions to get North Korea to denuclearize, it forces Kim Jong-un to hold more tightly to his nuclear program and reduce the aperture for engagement and diplomacy. Fifth, at the moment, it does not appear that North Korea is willing to part with its nuclear program. That will continue to be true unless the United States can make progress on the diplomatic front. The bottom line is we assume that North Korea will never part with its nuclear program, but we simply do not know this for sure. It is an assumption that renders diplomacy null and void. Sixth, Kim Jong-un is not easily swayed by economic pressure. In an effort to contain COVID, Pyongyang has voluntarily imposed an, uh, an isolation of itself far more devastating than sanctions could ever be. Trade with China is down by 80% or more, and the GDP in North Korea is down by an estimated 10% or more. Uh, despite all of this, the government is signaling its determination to stand fast until the pand pandemic ends. Not for the first time, Pyongyang is demonstrating that it will impose massive suffering on its population to pursue its goals. North Korea will never make the first concessions, demanding that Pyongyang dismantle its nuclear program first in hopes of being rewarded later is a deal that Kim will likely never, uh, never take up. And finally, meanwhile, uh, China's leader, Xi Jinping, has shown repeatedly that Beijing still prioritizes stability on the Korean Peninsula over North Korean denuclearization. North Korea is very aware of Beijing's calculus. Now turning to the second uh, point of my, of my talk tonight, uh, traditional U.S. policy toward North Korea. Although Washington's enduring North Korea strategy is not being contained in a document passed down through administrations, it has remained remarkably consistent from Clinton through Trump. It could be summarized as negotiate an end to North Korea's nuclear weapons program through diplomatic and economic leverage while maintaining regional stability and minimizing risk through multilateral diplomacy, military restraint, and extended deterrence guarantees to U.S. allies. The strategy has rested on assumptions that have proven false time and time again. The first is that Washington could wield sufficient leverage to override the Kim, Kim's regime's desire for nuclear weapons. The second is that Washington could obtain sufficient cooperation from Beijing to persuade the, uh, Pyongyang to denuclearize. Washington remains trapped by these untenable assumptions, in part because of what uh, discarding them would mean for the larger priorities like regional stability, global nonproliferation, and relations with China. If Washington acknowledged that it did not have sufficient leverage to get Kim, the Kim regime to negotiate away its nuclear program, it could be seen as accepting North Korea uh, as a nuclear armed power or presenting military conflict as the only recourse. Either possibility would be politically unpalatable and unacceptably risky. So what's the Biden's uh, administration's likely strategy to be? We have to look at this in terms of his strategy toward North Korea and also what is palatable inside the United States. What will the United States body politic, and the American public accept. Based on early statements coming from those around President Biden, as well as previous stances of those put forth by members of his national security team, there is, appears to be some evolution in thought about the North Korea problem set, but not a wholesale change in how to approach the challenge. The Biden administration appears open to the possibility of diplomacy and even negotiations, 
but only on US terms, meaning that North Korea must first make tangible and irreversible steps toward denuclearization. There has not been any real discussion of what the US is prepared to do in order to get into a negotiation with North Korea. What concessions it is willing to make on the front end uh, and the fundamental problem that the new administrations face on the issue of North Korea is that it is politically unpalatable to make upfront concessions needed to entice North Korea into its serious, serious negotiations. This looks like rewarding bad behavior. Of course, North Korea's bad behavior at the beginning of new administrations does not help and just perpetuates our view that North Korea is a land of no good options. Therefore, Washington's North Korea strategy has often been characterized by caution and inconsistency and in influence campaigns, including beating Pyongyang up on its human rights record, because such efforts could be seen as a distraction from getting Pyongyang to the table for denuclearization negotiations. This point was made by a good friend of mine and somebody who I work with, Marcus Karlauskas, and I think it's absolutely right. Trump was able to get further than most because of the unconventional nature of his presidency. He was able to take a top-down approach and throw caution out the window that has hamstrung most other administrations. The problem with the Trump approach is that it had no follow-on strategy. Another problem was that his administration was continued insistence on maximum pressure which for all intents and purposes looked a lot like strategic patience. All pressure and no carrots is ultimately doomed to fail as a viable strategy for North Korea. Even in the period of summitry in 2018 and 2019, the United States slapped many, many sanctions on North Korea. If what we wanted to do was show Pyongyang that good behavior and engaging in diplomacy is the right thing to do, we kind of shot ourselves in the foot. Most likely the Biden administration will try to dis distinguish itself by saying that it is willing to engage North Korea and make concessions as long as North Korea makes the first concessions on its nuclear program. If, it pr if this proves to be the case, it will likely mean that the Biden administration will ultimately fail to make much progress in solving the North Korea problem. As the asymmetrically weaker power, North Korea cannot make the first substantive concessions. Doing so would only make it weaker vis-a-vis -vis its sworn enemy and undermine the legitimacy of the Supreme Leader. So what needs to be done? Given the situation we find ourselves in today after decades of failed policy, the Biden administration seek to escape the inertia of predecessors by cap crafting a pragmatic new strategy toward North Korea. This should be premised on not on not on Beijing's cooperation, uh, nor on Kim's willingness to denuclearize, but rather on how to address the growing risks of a resolutely nuclear armed North Korea. The new strategy should focus on reducing the risks of regional destabilization and military escalation stemming from North Korea's growing nuclear and missile capabilities. It should do so by working with allies to shore up its deterrence while offering expanded engagement to Pyongyang on issues beyond denuclearization. The strategy should also foster long-term changes inside North Korea. Domestic and external conditions to fundamentally change its behavior and calculus in ways that could eventually make North-South reconciliation uh, and denuclearization feasible. This comes by fostering the belief within the North Korean leadership that its nuclear program is a bargaining chip that can be used through negotiation to achieve economic development, stability, and long-term regime survival. A good start would be for the Biden administration to engage in active diplomacy with North Korea to achieve small gains that mitigate the security threat. This could be centered on some kind of reciprocal concessions to lay the groundwork for future relationship building. But in order to set the table, the Biden administration will have to make the first moves to convince Pyongyang that the United States is acting in good faith. 
So taking a tip page from the Trump strategy of a top-down strategy, a top-down approach uh, might be a good idea, but maybe probably not president to supreme leader, but somewhere a little bit, you know, one or two steps down from that. All that said, in my opinion, the Biden administration does not have the political capital at the moment to solve the North Korea problem uh, on the front end of his term in office. He has a lot of stuff on his plate domestically, as well as a lot of stuff on his plate uh, in terms of foreign and security policy. Uh, so in, in that case, it, uh, it seems that he is highly unlikely to get support from Congress or the American public to make the substantive co concessions that would be needed up front to get North Korea into a negotiation. That said, there are likely some required tenets for a successful North Korea strategy. And this is uh, my final points. One, understand North Korea and Kim Jong-un's equities and leverage off of them. Shift the new strategy's focus away from near-term denuclearization. Focus on denying North Korea any perceived political military advantages from improved nuclear and missile capabilities. The U.S. needs to make the first concessions, including sanctions relief and security guarantees. If it is not able to do this at the moment, publicly endorsing the inter-Korean dialogue may be the best way forward. Maybe also a dialogue between Tokyo and Pyongyang on the abduction issue. In other words, let the U.S. allies take the lead for the moment. The most that we can hope for uh, from North Korea in return to uh, secure is to secure some dismantling of Yongbyon. Uh, if we are not willing to roll back the sanctions of 2016 and 2017, don't expect North Korea to pull out uh, of all of its assets out of Yongbyon. The goal should be to freeze the North Korean program. No testing, no proliferation, and no, uh, no provocations. And in this way, uh, North Korea would retain a, a, a nuclear program for legitimacy purposes, but not a yet a fully developed one that can threaten the United States. Unburdened by unrealistic expectations for the near-term progress on denuclearization, the Biden administration could open a, a range of broad engagement avenues with North Korea and South Korea. And also resist the impulse to beat up on North Korea on the issue of human rights. This only shuts off communication and tightens Pyongyang's grip on its nuclear program. Progress on human rights comes about as part of an organic process tied to North Korean economic development and the sprouting of civil society inside that country. It cannot be forced from the outside nor if we're ever, uh, not if we're ever to foster change inside North Korea. And finally, ultimately U.S. strategy toward North Korea needs to shift from a zero-sum game on the peninsula to a wider regional strategy that helps strengthen the U.S. footprint in the region. Thank you. Director Ken Gauss. Uh, very uh, interesting uh, presentation, uh, also including comparison between the previous Trump administration and the new uh, Biden administration. Uh, I, I expect a lot of uh, interesting and debate from our, uh, our panelists. Okay, uh, next, uh, let's go to Vipin Narang from MIT. Uh, can you start beeping? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Thank okay. you. Okay. Uh, let's go, please. All right. Good to see everybody. Thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I want to commend the conference organizers for picking an impeccably timed day to do the conference. Uh, the day after Kim Jong-un tested uh, ballistic missiles for the first time in over a year. Uh, and it's, uh, it's interesting, I think it's, it's worth talking about sort of some of the motivations for this particular test, what it might have been, and 
what it means for the Biden administration and for South Korea going forward with North Korea and why now. Um, and I think the, 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 the nature of this test uh, is quite important. So you had over the weekend sort of a very quiet short range cruise missile test that was unannounced by either South Korea or the United States media until several days after the test. And then the next day, Kim Jong-un, um, uh, North Korea, Kim Jong-un wasn't present for this test, tests uh, a new short range ballistic missile, which it seems like an upgraded variant of the solid fuel KN-23, which is a very, very capable and frankly scary missile if I'm South Korea, because it's solid fuel and it can do in-flight maneuvers and poses significant challenges to missile defenses. And the, the big takeaway, I think for me at least, is the announcement that this new system can carry a two and a half ton warhead. Kim Jong-un promised in his New Year's Day address that North Korea would continue to work on tactical nuclear systems. One way to develop tactical nuclear weapon systems is to continue to work to make your nuclear warheads lighter and more compact so they can fit on short range ballistic missiles that carry 500 kilogram or half ton payloads. The other way is to design your short range ballistic missiles to carry 2.5 ton warheads. So you can use your existing nuclear warheads on short range tactical ballistic missiles. These missiles are fast, they fly low, um, and they uh, pose a significant threat, I think, both to South Korea and the United States and the region at large. And they have a very significant nuclear component because of the size of the payload. And so Kim Jong-un and North Korea test these missiles now for the first time uh, in over a year, uh, partly because this is what maturing nuclear weapons powers do. They test their systems as they improve them. Uh, also, I think as a response to joint American and South Korean exercises, but also as a, as a sort of reminder after laying low because of COVID, because of the presidential election, that Kim Jong-un still has nuclear weapons. He never promised to give them up. He's still expanding and improving that missile force. And whatever hope the Biden administration might have had to defer North Korea in its foreign policy priorities and focus on China or Afghanistan uh, may be accelerated by Kim Jong-un's testing sequence and cycle. So this is a moment where the Biden administration you know, has to sort of accelerate its focus on North Korea as it's conducting the review. A lot of my comments, I think, agree and dovetail nicely with Ken's. Um, I start with essentially three assumptions about North Korea's nuclear weapons program. Uh, and this latest test of this upgraded KN-23 is just the latest reminder uh, of you know, some, some of the, the validity of some of the assumptions. So first, Kim Jong-un is not going to unilaterally and voluntarily surrender his nuclear weapons. When we talk about denuclearization, North Korea has made it clear, and the United States is largely uh, accepted by using the term denuclearization and not disarmament, that North Korea is not going to voluntarily surrender his nuclear weapons now that he has them. In fact, historically, only one state has ever relinquished its nuclear weapons program voluntarily after acquiring nuclear weapons and developing them, and that's South Africa. And the parallels between North Korea and South Africa are quite poor. Uh, the factors that led to South Africa relinquishing its nuclear weapons program um, don't exist presently in North Korea. It doesn't mean that they will never exist, but so long as Kim Jong-un is in power or the Kim dynasty is in power uh, and most successor, successor regimes, uh, after the experience with Libya uh, and Gaddafi, it is unlikely that North Korea is going to voluntarily relinquish nuclear weapons. So that's assumption number one. Assumption number two is that eliminating North Korea's nuclear weapons program by force is essentially impossible at this point without risking nuclear use in the region or against the United States. We simply don't know how many nuclear weapons North Korea has, where they might be, that we can get them all, that missile defenses might be able to pick up any residuals. And it's an exceptionally sporting proposition, despite what John Bolton may continue to write, to try to disarm North Korea by force before Kim Jong-un or North Korea could fire a nuclear weapon at 
in the region or against the United States uh, and, and cause uh, irreparable damage. The third assumption, and I think this is an important point that Ken made, is that despite all of this, Kim Jong-un would prefer sanctions relief. Sanctions relief uh, is, is, is not something that Kim Jong-un uh, or sanctions are not something that Kim Jong-un wants to necessarily live with indefinitely and permanently, despite what China and Russia may be doing to take the air out of the ma maximum pressure campaign. And Kim Jong-un's objective, North Korea's objective, is to be essentially uh, accepted de facto, if not de jure, as a nuclear weapons power, like India and Pakistan before it, with sanctions removed, and with uh, essentially the freedom to engage its regional neighbors and the broader world with nuclear weapons and with a missile force intact. And so that gives a range of possibilities as the Biden administration approaches this problem. Unlike the North Korea of 2016, when now President Biden was Vice President Biden, North Korea indisputably has a thermonuclear ICBM capability that can hold the US homeland at risk. And the testing sprint that North Korea undertook in 2017 and has continued to improve and expand upon since then during the Trump administration forces the United States to shift its paradigm from counter proliferation, stopping North Korea from developing the bomb to reducing the risks of a North Korea with the bomb. And so the sort of mindset shift is from disarmament to risk reduction. And I think this is a helpful framework to think about how the Biden administration may hopefully approach the North Korea problem. I think the, the, the paradox of the Trump administration was that a lot of the uh, optimism that was generated by the, leader, the leadership meeting at Singapore and Hanoi eroded when the Trump administration President Trump and John Bolton, but also Secretary Pompeo, continued to insist that North Korea had agreed to denuclearization of the DPRK as agreed to by Chairman Kim at Singapore, which is something Kim Jong-un never did. And this was seen as uh, you know, the United States continuing to insist on unilateral disarmament. It is unfortunate, in my view, that the Biden administration has sometimes used this formulation, denuclearization of North Korea, as opposed to the formulation used in all joint statements between South Korea and the United South Korea and North Korea and the United States and North Korea, which is denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, which implies obligations on both sides, not necessarily that the United States would relinquish its nuclear weapons or that the United States would break the alliance with South Korea, but that it is a bilateral or trilateral process where the United States would make some concessions to North Korea in exchange for denuclearization steps that reduce the risks from North Korea's growing nuclear weapons and missile program. The key point is that the formulation chosen, denuclearization of North Korea or denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, is not the end point in a negotiation. It is the starting point. The key to using the formulation that North Korea has agreed to, denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, is to get North Korea to pick up the phone and meet you at the table. Not the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula is actually the realistic or likely endpoint of the negotiation. One of the other, uh, I think, unfortunate features of the Trump administration strategy, which I think became, you know, somewhat. Um, apparent at Hanoi, although there's some ambiguity as to who held a stronger line at Hanoi. I think both Kim Jong-un and President Trump showed up at Hanoi uh, expecting and demanding maximal concessions from the other side. But from the United States side, the insistence that North Korea not only close Yongbyon, the plutonium production, tritium production, reprocessing facility, and uranium enrichment at Yongbyon, but also the undeclared facilities and the ballistic missile production facilities and the chemical and biological weapon, chemical or biological weapons facilities in North Korea was a non-starter for Kim Jong Un at the outset. And so the the Biden administration has an opportunity, instead of the the Trump administration's all or nothing approach, 
to focus on a stepwise in tandem approach, which works towards certain objectives in sequence. One, and most importantly, initially, slow the growth of the program down. At the, its current pace, North Korea's nuclear and missile program is essentially unconstrained and continues to grow, improve, and expand uh, every day that passes without a deal. Once you slow the program down, you can focus on achieving caps on particular capabilities, missile material production, uh, development of you know, specific types of nuclear weapons, ICBMs. But slowing the growth of the program down in exchange for some sort of sanctions relief builds confidence in the negotiating and diplomatic process and sets up the conditions for seeking potentially caps on the program. Once you cap certain capabilities, you can talk about reversing certain capabilities reducing the number of potential ICBMs or nuclear warheads in the inventory. At the end of the road, rhetorically, one can maintain complete disarmament as a potential end goal, knowing realistically that slowing, capping, and reversing the direction of the, of the program at least achieves meaningful security objectives in the region. The key to a risk reduction approach is reducing the chance of a conflict between North and South Korea, between the United States and North Korea, and reducing the chance that a nuclear weapon might be used either inadvertently or advertently in anger in the event of a conflict. It also attempts to reduce the risk that North Korea tries to sell nuclear or ballistic missile technology to adversaries. Uh, or other countries in the system for hard cash. There have been known there have been known contacts between North Korea and potential proliferative concerns such as South uh, such, such as Syria, Burma, Pakistan, and reducing the risk of vertical proliferation. So the size of North Korea's force internally, in addition to the risks of horizontal proliferation, achieves meaningful security objectives. So the Biden administration, as it undertakes its review, I hope, and I have no particular insight into what the Biden administration will conclude, cannot de jure accept North Korea's nuclear weapons program. But it does not mean that it cannot negotiate with a nuclear North Korea, potentially coexist with a nuclear North Korea, and work to reduce the risks that come out of a nuclear North Korea. And the challenge forward is working with our partners, South Korea and Japan, to present a unified front against Kim Jong-un in North Korea. It is, I'm not optimistic that China will be of much assistance with the North Korean nuclear challenge. China still prefers a nuclear North Korea as a buffer against the Western alliance to a North Korea that is desperate with its back up against the wall. But as the Biden administration approaches the North Korea challenge, shifting from sort of the disarmament paradigm to the risk reduction paradigm gives it an opportunity, I think, to get diplomatic negotiations underway. And I think President Biden today in his press conference struck exactly the right note, which is he noted that the KN-23 variant test was a violation of UN Security Council Resolution 1718, and that the United States would work with its partners, South Korea and Japan, uh, to uh, respond if North Korea continues to escalate its testing sequence. But it also keeps the door open to negotiations with denuclearization as an endpoint. And denuclearization has the virtue of meaning uh, anything to and everything to both parties. And the, the virtue of the phrase denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula is that it allows both parties to initiate negotiations as a, and as a starting point for negotiations, it does not have to be the end point. And so as the Biden administration approaches its review, um, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic uh, that there will be a focus sort of on the risk reduction paradigm, that there are meaningful objectives, security objectives to be had by slowing the growth of the program, capping the program, reversing the program in tandem and in exchange for 
uh, a step-by-step -step sort of sanctions relief, which can be, of course, snapped back if North Korea cheats, violates its commitments, uh, which it has, of course, done repeatedly in the past. But I think Kim Jong-un, now that he's a nuclear weapons power, can negotiate with confidence. Uh, I think it is worth noting that unlike the presidential transitions in the past, Kim Jong-un did not greet President Biden with a major provocation between November and January. Each test in the past week has been calibrated. They have been um, uh, they, they, they have been sort of uh, reminders that North Korea's nuclear and missile program still exists. It is still improving, but they were not ICBM tests. They were not submarine launch ballistic missile. They weren't focus on tests. And so Kim Jong-un is also leaving the room, the room open and the door open for negotiations. And, you know, hopefully both sides have it, which have an interest in sort of striking a risk reduction deal. Don't allow domestic politics uh, or emotion or sort of the, the hangover of the failed policies of past administrations to prevent them from continuing to push on diplomatic doors. So I'll stop there and I look forward to comments and dis discussion. Um, and uh, I thank you very much uh, for your time and for having me today. Oh, thank you, Vipin. Uh, I think Vipin uh, talked about very practical approach or a pragmatic approach to North Korean nuclear issue. Uh, also, I think uh, uh, we expect a lot of discussions about your point of views. All right. Uh, uh, thank you for both of your uh, very interesting presentations. Uh, let's move on uh, discussions. Uh, we have uh, uh, five discussants on here, our program. Uh, let me introduce briefly uh, the discussant. Uh, Professor Su jung from Gyeonghi University and uh, Professor Kim Tae-hyung from sung University. Uh, also, we have uh, uh, Professor Mason Ritchie from uh, uh, Korean University of Foreign Languages. And also we have uh, uh, Dr. Woo jung Yum from Sejong Institute. And finally, we have a Professor Jo Dong-jun uh, from Seoul National University, but he will participate here by online, so he is not here. Okay, uh, uh, you can discuss uh, either can or beefing or both, right, uh, about the topics uh, as you uh, uh, prepare. Okay, uh, each of you, I ask you about seven, less than seven minutes, uh, your uh, discussions, right? Okay, uh, please, uh, Professor Seo jung uh, can you start? Okay, um, uh, thanks a lot, Prof uh, Professor and President uh, Lee. Uh, I'm uh, Seo jung <coughs> uh, uh, at, uh, uh, at the University of North Carolina. I, I used to be there at the uh, Kyung University in Seoul, Korea. Uh, and I'm very grateful to, very grateful to uh, KIAS uh, and President Chan Jae Song uh, for having invited me uh, to this great panel. Uh, even though I'm not an IR scholar, I'm studying American politics and foreign policy, uh, but I'm a proud member of KIS. Um, so given the, the, the limited time uh, given to me, I would like to first up say that I totally agree with uh, Ken and Vipin's uh, points about like uh, time for uh, new changes, new approaches and wholesale uh, and pragmatic uh, sort of path-breaking uh, fresh eyes in terms of dealing with North Korea. Um, as we all remember, we have tested uh, much different kinds of waters before, like we have experienced strategic patience of the Obama time, or we have experienced the maximum pressure of the uh, Trump time, but 
But as uh, Ken has uh, 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 nicely said, those uh, US foreign policies have been largely reactive, but not, uh, not active, uh, not to mention any follow-up strategies or any systematic approaches. So we have failed almost all of those previous administrations' uh, approaches to North Korea. So I, I, I totally believe that it's time for kind of new and wholesome, uh, wholesale changes in uh, how to respond uh, to North Korea. Uh, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm condemning North Korea 100% for the security uh, threat posed to the Korean Peninsula. But my, my position is always the same, that we need to solve the problem. That's uh, life or death, literally speaking, problem to us living in uh, living on the Korean Peninsula. So on top of what Ken and Vipin suggested about why we need uh, new changes, uh, new approaches to North Korea, I would like to add a couple more reasons why. The first up is, uh, has to do with the nature of the US and North Korea relationship. I believe there is a small debate between Robert Jervis and uh, Jim Furon, uh, even though it's not direct kind of back and forth the debate between them, but it was a debate between uh, those uh, uh, prestigious, prestigious IR scholars uh, through the newspapers. Robert Jervis is saying that US-North Korea problem is a security dilemma. Jim Furon said, no, it's a typical anarchy problem in uh, international relations. And I would rather side with uh, Jim Furon uh, on that regard uh, because there has been no real track records between the two countries. There has been no trust built between the two countries. So I believe that uh, uh, there is not only Ronald Reagan's version of trust but verify, but I believe there is North Korean version of trust but verify toward a US strategy regarding North Korea. And uh, related to that, uh, uh, sort of argument, I, ha I think it, uh, it has a huge implication, which means that the so-called big deal approach is not going to work between the two countries. Uh, big deal approach, as uh, tested by the former administration, uh, particularly by John Bolton, could sound, particularly to North Korea, that, oh, we will not give up anything until you give up everything. So we have to sometimes put ourselves in, our, in North Korea's shoes uh, in order to solve the problem of North Korea and its, its nuclear uh, programs. Uh, and the second reason for new approaches needed is uh, the fact that we all know. We have to pursue two very challenging and dilemma situation and goals. One is we have to uh, keep pursuing denuclearization of North Korea. But at the same time, we have to avoid any military conflicts on the Korean Peninsula or in South Korea. South Korea is uh, similar with the state of Indiana in terms of the size. So uh, like I said before, it's not necessarily I'm enthusiastic about uh, the peace processes, but my argument or my belief is that there is no alternative to peace processes or phased approaches. And um, I have uh, so only two minutes left. Just quickly, I would like to also say something about not only what to do, but also how to do it. So as an Americanist, I would like to challenge some conventional wisdom, uh, as Ken suggested and we've been implied as well. Is it still unpalatable for the Biden administration, the Democratic administration, to make upfront concessions to North Korea to entice North Korea to serious negotiations. My reading, my understanding, my studying uh, is that uh, the so-called security gap between the two parties, Republicans and Democrats, in the context of American domestic politics, like the domestic, uh, Democrats are being soft on North Korea, Democrats are soft on national security, those security gap in domestic politics of America has somewhat dwindled, somewhat kind of narrowed down ever since George W. Bush's failure in the Iraq war, ever since Obama's killing of Osama bin Laden in 2012. 2012. 
and even ever since the Trump administration trying to sit with uh, Chairman Kim on the international stage. So I believe the perception in the American domestic politics among American public might be, well, Kim Jong-un is not that crazy guy. Kim Jong-un is someone we can talk to. So that's the kind of um, uh, my reading of American domestic context uh, uh, that uh, might provide some kind of leverage for the Biden administration. And the second domestic component of American politics related to North Korea is that I believe North Korea seems to have very sort of zero to little domestic constituency. That's a kind of two-sided story, of course. But compared to Iran or compared to China, I think the Biden administration could use a huge kind of policy leverage, uh, given the fact that domestic, uh, domestically, North Korea is a kind of safe uh, kind of territory to touch, or uh, the kind of the policy area that Biden administration can spend his political capital during the uh, for, uh, first uh, early stages of the administration, as <clears throat> Vipin uh, has suggested. So uh, I, I don't know. Maybe uh, in the second round of uh, discussions, maybe I can add some kind of pessimistic realities as well. But finally, uh, just very quickly. Uh, let me share my wild dream. Uh, when you go back to the American political history of normalizations with former adversaries, uh, there seems to be some kind of commonalities. Uh, Jimmy Carter in 1979 with China after 1949. Bill Clinton in uh, 1995 with Vietnam after 1975. Or uh, Barack Obama in uh, 2015 with Cuba after 1960. So the commonalities are here is that democratic president after the midterm uh, plus some kind of historic years. So I'm eyeing toward the 2023 mm. as a so, sort of a long-term strategy mm. like democratic president after the midterm mm. and the 70-year adversary. Uh, uh, Ken is laughing now, but this is my wild dream mm. Uh, mm. to share. Uh, but who knows? So let me stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Sir. Uh, so uh, President Biden should be re-elected after four years, right? Uh, to Korea Peninsula to be denuclearized. Anyway, thank you. Uh, let's go next uh, uh, discussant, uh, Professor Kim Taehyung. Please start. Yeah. Hi. Uh, my name is Taehyung Kim uh, from Sungshil University in Seoul, Korea. Um, I'm greatly honored to be here. Um, I've been working uh, with the, the KAIS uh, for quite some time, and uh, it's, been a, it's been a while that uh, I actually participated in uh, this uh, wonderful discussion. And I'm also honored to uh, be listening to um, great insights uh, from the um, experts uh, of the United States. Um, if I briefly uh, explain about my, my background, that um, I've been working on um, nuclear aspect, especially uh, on the Indochina conflict. Actually, I wrote a book on Indochina conflict, uh, focusing on a nuclear dimension, uh, nuclear development and nuclear deterrence strategy, uh, how it evolved and uh, um, the, the force posture and things like that. Um, so I think my uh, questions and comments will uh, concentrate on uh, Professor Narang. Um, so I, I agree with uh, both of you um, that uh, we need to uh, be very um, um, prudent uh, to pursue um, the um, North Korean problem uh, step by step and the uh, pragmatic and realistic approach. Um, I agree with uh, both of you. Um, um, but um, the considering uh, what we have um, regarding North Korea's uh, nuclear status um, and the uh, continuing tension uh, around the Korean Peninsula, uh, the top priority uh, should be um, uh, maintaining uh, regional stability. And the, um, if something happen, even if something happens, um, we, we should absolutely we should prevent uh, the, the crisis escalating uh, out of control. So that said, I'd like to uh, uh, pay my attention to the uh, South, South Asia. Um, I mean, Indo, Indo, India-Pakistan have been um, 
fighting uh, for, for quite some time. And uh, the most recent conflict occurred in February 2019 um, after the terrorist attack. Um, and and the, the Modi administration uh, responded by uh, intentionally escalating, uh, by um, airstriking uh, the, not just uh, the Pakistan-administered Kashmir, but Pakistan, uh, ter Pakistan territory itself. And the Pakistan uh, responded accordingly. Um, so there was a considerable um, uh, concern that uh, this might be the um, you know, escalation of um, uh, the conflict between the two nuclear powers. Uh, but uh, quite fortunately, uh, it didn't really escalate to the very dangerous level. And after the exchange of um, um, the, sh the shutdown, the pilot to uh, re I mean, they, he returned to India, um, it, it calmed down, and the both sides, both uh, uh, India and Pakistan, claimed the victory. Um, but the problem was that um, this incident uh, might have given long, wrong lessons, wrong lessons to both countries. Uh, that um, uh, even if we cross the, the red line. Um, set by the other side, uh, we were okay. There was no dangerous level of escalation, and the, the, so uh, the wrong lesson they might uh, have gotten from this incident uh, uh, is that um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the future, if something happens again, then we'll do the same thing. Uh, we'll escalate, uh, but still, we'll be okay. Escalation control will be easy. Uh, so I read some of the um, uh, reports and the seminars, um, uh, you know, the, analyzing this incident, and um, it was kind of kind of worrisome. Um, so back to the Korean Peninsula. If we if we look at what we've been doing, um, South Korea and the United States have been doing uh, to respond to uh, possible North Korean provocation, nuclear provocation. Uh, there is some, uh, uh, you know. Uh, comparable uh, worrisome trend in here, uh, especially in the South Korean side. Uh, it's completely understandable that we've been trying to build a robust um, deterrence capability uh, against possible North Korean provocation, uh, name, uh, namely the uh, three pillars, uh, the uh, kill chain and KAMD and KMPR. Uh, but it, all three of them uh, understandably I mean, it, I mean, it's understandable that what, why, and how South Korea has been doing. But uh, all these three have contained, uh, s uh, you know, somewhat uh, dangerous uh, um, uh, postures uh, because many of these are questionably, uh, I mean, technologically questionable, and also in, in response to the North Korean possible North Korean provocation. Uh, it could damage um, crisis stability uh, significantly. Um, because if North Korea knows what we are going to do, then uh, North Korea would respond, uh, making it more, even more dangerous. Um, so in both South Asia and the Korean Peninsula, the trend has been moving toward uh, somewhat dangerous level. Um, if something, some kind of crisis happens, um, it could it could it could move to the dangerous level. Uh, so, the what I'm think what I'm considering the most important thing is how to make sure um, escalation. I mean, I mean, preventing escalation getting out of control, and how to balance uh, between establishing a firm uh, deterrence capability and preventing um, um, crisis instability. Uh, that's that's might be concern. And another short question to Professor Narang is that um, you wrote recently about the possible state. I mean, the, the, some things, contents that would be included in the new NPR, new nuclear posture review. And you uh, argued for the sole purpose. What should be the sole purpose of the? I mean, what should be included in the NPR? The sole purpose of the U.S. nuclear um, arsenal is to deter uh, nuclear attack uh, from adversaries, uh, right? Uh, but I, I, agree, I agree with you. I agree with you that, that it de-emphasized the, the role of nuclear weapons in the United States. Uh, at the same time, it can uh, assure, reassure 
uh, the allies that uh, we are we are you know we are committing we are still committing to extended deterrence but still uh, many in east asia like uh, south korea and japan still concerned that's not enough that's not assuring enough uh, that sort proposed statement is not assuring enough so what would be uh, your answer to um, or your uh, reassuring uh, statement about their their worry um, so Oh, that's all. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Kim tae uh, Okay. Uh, let's move on, uh, Professor Mason Richie. Is my microphone on? Oh, we don't have to touch it. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so, first of all, uh, thanks um, to uh, President Chun Chae Sung. Um, uh, and Professor Wang Jiwan for uh, inviting me uh, to be a discussant on this um, excellent panel. Oh, I guess I can take off my mask now. We're allowed to do that when we talk. Um, so uh, I just want to uh, thank, obviously, Kais for <coughs> inviting me to this excellent event. Thanks to the other panelists um, and, of course, to our uh, two speakers um, from the United States. Um, I will do something that I almost never do, which is I will keep myself under my time limit and I will work very hard at it. Um, and the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to, more than making any comments, I'm just going to ask a few questions, I think. Um, and I think I can learn something and hopefully that will also um, spark some discussion, which you know, might go around uh, the virtual table um, as much as it's just ping-ponging back yeah. off of um, our uh, two distinguished presenters today. Um, so, you know, to start off with one brief observation, um, I think one thing that comes out of, you know, the conversation today is that, um, you know, the, the crux of the matter in some ways with respect to the, the ball of strategic mess that the U.S. and, and, and North Korea uh, find themselves involved in is sanctions and nuclear weapons and effectively, the U.S. wants sanctions in order to convince North Korea to come to the table. And when they do so with leverage, North Korea wants to hold out against those sanctions until essentially the United States and the rest of the international community that's involved in sanctions simply gives up and says, you know, de facto or in some other way, you know, this isn't working anymore. And so let's somehow, uh, you know, come to the table and, and negotiate in a way that's massively favorable to North Korea. Obviously, neither side wants that. There doesn't seem to be an overlap um, on the, the spectrum of outcomes um, that allows that to, to really take place, and no one's really figured that out yet. Um, and uh, the, the second thing, um, I guess I want to start then briefly discussing um, um, Ken Gauss's um, presentation. I mean, the two things that, that I, I think I take away from that that are really, I think, extremely important um, and I'm certainly glad that he mentioned them, uh, or in the first place, the discussion of domestic political constraints in the U.S. Um, you know, too often we, you know, we get a bird's eye international affairs view of things and we don't pay attention to simply um, the domestic political constra constraints that aren't merely those of perception, but also, you know, bureaucratic um, imperatives within the Defense Department and the State Department and Treasury and, you know, the National Security Council, and there are different strands within the bureaucratic universe or the interagency universe, and, you know, I think we don't pay enough attention to those um, in international relations. Um, and then the second thing, which is also very important and something that you know, I think all too often you know, we're guilty of is not taking North Korea's perspective into account. Perhaps the Moon administration is the exception in that regard. Um, my, my fear, however, is that um, uh, Ken Gauss's, um, I, I want to say, you know, policy proposal um, seems to focus on small steps and concessions um, that I just don't think Kim is interested in. Um, and, you know, a lot of these, these small steps and, and small things that we do in order to get the ball rolling, you know, Kim, whether they come from South Korea or from the U.S., I just don't think that Kim and his regime are interested in those things. And it's not entirely the quote-unquote fault of Trump for starting with this, you know, big hit approach and, you know, symmetry and leader level, uh, you know, leader level talks. Um, you know, he opened up a door is one way to look at it, and you can say, all right, maybe that's an, a door that we should go through again. You can also call it a Pandora's box. It sort of depends on your perspective. Um, but I think, um, you know, 
Kim's not interested in a lot of those small things, and we see that all the time here in, on the peninsula when you know, South Korea you know, offers something positive to North Korea, which is immediately slapped down as being insufficient. Um, so to get to my questions then, um, first one, um, do you think that the Biden administration really has fresh eyes? Um, you said that there's a possibility for, have that, for having that. Do you think that that's really the case? Um, is there evidence of that? Um, with respect to the North Korea policy review, have there been any from your meetings that you might be willing to talk about? Um, uh, you know, potential leaks in terms of what the policy review might end up uh, showing to us and to any of those um, potential strands of the, the um, policy review that might have leaked out? Do they indicate that there is, in fact, a, a fresh approach? Um, you also mentioned both in your written comments and very briefly in your spoken comments today um, a discussion of uh, internal changes in North Korea. Um, and I'm wondering um, if you could talk a little bit more about that and notably um, you know, how you're thinking that you know, a, an effort to try to make, you know, to foster some internal changes in North Korea doesn't undercut some of the other elements um, of a potential strategy with North Korea. Um, and then thirdly, directly for, for Ken Gauss again, um, I have a question about policy process. You know, I remember reading this thing, oh, I don't know, like a year ago or, or, or two years ago or something. Uh, somebody wrote this sort of satirical piece of what happens when um, a, a government uh, agency asks a think tanker to come to a meeting and the, the think tanker gets all excited and is like, all right, I'm gonna get to meet the you know, assistant secretary or the undersecretary or maybe if I'm lucky, the actual secretary is gonna be there and like, wow, I'm gonna get to lay out my brilliant you know, 10 point plan for ABC issue. Um, and then, you know, eventually what happens is it all gets turned around and the think tank ends up being sort of downloaded, um, you know, receiving a download from the administration about whatever it is that they want to go forward. And the idea is that, you know, the, the tables have been flipped and, in fact, the think tank ends up, you know, you know broadcasting the message that the government more or less already decided on. Um, and I guess my, my, my question that comes out of that is, I mean, do you think that in terms of uploading new ideas into the administration that are coming out of think tanks in Washington, do you think that there's much purchase there or is this going to fall into the sort of similar way that think tanks and government tend to, um, tend to interact? Um, and then for uh, Professor Narang, um, thanks for the technical update. I actually hadn't had a chance to take a look at that, so it's, I, I didn't even know about the two and a half warhead thing. I haven't had a chance to check my, my news this morning. Um, I note that, if I remember correctly, the Hyunmu has a two-ton uh, two warhead, so it's sort of like Kim Jong-un said, I can do, one, do you one better. I don't know if that was intentional or not. I'm sure there are operational reasons for that, as you pointed out, but that's kind of interesting. Um, I just want to ask three, three questions about your assumptions. Um, and so the first one is you, you say uh, that there's a constrained nuclear force is pre preferable to an unconstrained nuclear force. Um, surely that's true, uh, but why is it superior to a strategy of pressure or patience that attempts to coordinate a possible denuclearization in the future? Or if I can put it differently, why is cutting losses now better than continuing to try to engineer a more ideal outcome in the future? Um, or to put it yet another way, um, is what you're likely is what you're arguing for uh, likely to be there in the future? So, is there a rush to try to to stop some of this, you know, to freeze some of this stuff now? Uh, and how much higher would the floor be um, on this future unconstrained arsenal in two years, four years, or five years when you might say, okay, now we're ready to cut our losses? Um, Looking then at assumptions three and four, they seem to imply something about North Korea's um, nuclear posture and doctrine. Um, you say eliminating them by force risks nuclear use against the South Korea, J South Korea, Japan, and the U.S. And then four, Kim Jong-un would nevertheless like sanctions relief because he has some excess capabilities. Um, that seems to imply both of those something about some knowledge that we have about North Korea's nuclear doctrine and posture. Um, can you discuss that a little bit more? Um, and to put it very, I mean, just a sort of provocative question from my perspective, what is an excess nuclear capability? Like I can imagine that North Korea's answer to that is, we have no excess capability. It's all great. <laughs> we don't want to get rid of any of it. Um, and then uh, I have a, new, a, a last question, uh, or two last questions, one of which is for both of you, but the first one is for Professor Narang. 
Um, you know, we tend in these types of talk, in these types of discussions to talk about policy related issues and we tend to kind of, kind of take the theoretical world and download it into the policy world. What about going the opposite direction? What of the empirical policy related stuff that we've talked about today or in general, uh, when we think about North Korea's nuclear weapons can be imported either supporting or challenging um, back into the theoretical world of understanding nuclear proliferation and strategy. Um, and then my last question for both of you, do, you've both talked about risk reduction in some way. So does risk reduction necessarily imply engagement involving a freeze? So I'm done now. Mm. I think I was seven minutes. So. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Mason Ritchie. Uh, I believe your, your questions and comments were delivered to both uh, presenters. Uh, let's move on. Uh, Dr. Woo jong -yum. Sejong Institute, please start. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Chan and Professor Lee for having me today for this uh, important event. And it's great to see you again, Ken and Vipin, uh, though it's online. Good to see you. <coughs> Uh, for uh, today's subject, I think that one of the important elements that we discussed is Biden administration's uh, review process of its North Korea policy. And it will discuss the small things like whether the new Biden administration is going to have special representative for North Korea policy within the State Department or there's going to be some different form of a special envoy within NSC or State Department or they are not going to have any kind of like special position for North Korean policy because there's nothing going on between two countries. And more bigger issue in the uh, North Korean policy review is basically how much United States and international community is going to pay for uh, North Korea's like, nuclear program and nuclear weapons. Uh, how much North US should pay, how much US can pay, and how much like US is willing to pay for the uh, progress toward denuclearization and uh, how much they can offer to North Korea. Uh, in 2019, around this time of the year uh, where we still can travel, I attended a conference uh, at Stanford University after the collapse of Hanoi meeting that there was discussion whether it was missing opportunity for the United States or it's a missing opportunity for North Korea. So some US participants argue that since Yongbyon is about 80% of North Korea's nuclear program, it's not a big loss for Trump to offer uh, sanctions relief that is demanded by North Korea. And there's, there's a discussion among participants. And one question that I raised is then, if Yongbyon is 80% of North Korea's nuclear program, then what's the rest of 20%? What's included in the rest of 20%? So I suggest, since 80% deal is too difficult, let's go to the 20% deal. What's included in 20% and 20% sanctions relief? The, the problem is to set the price for the North Korea's nuclear program, we, we should know what they have. But the problem is that North Korea is, has not been willing to negotiate in any comprehensive deal yet. So what they want is like action for action without committing itself toward the complete denuclearization but as uh, President Biden uh, a few hours ago mentioned that U.S. is still focusing on the end result of the denuclearization. So maybe uh, what Biden administration is thinking now is incremental implementation of comprehensive uh, denuclearization deal. So which, as both Ken and Vipin mentioned, that it's difficult, it's hard 
it's very difficult for North Korea to accept any negotiation on that thing. So the problem now is whether United States is going to lower the bar. But the problem now is whether that is politically beneficial for Biden administration or it's that urgent for Biden administration. And second issue that I want to discuss is very recently, including Secretary Blinken, that they used the term the denuclearization of DPRK instead of the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula, which causes some controversy in Korea and overseas. So I believe that in 2000, September 19, joint statement, we used the term the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula but it also explicitly mentions that what each party should do to achieve the complete denuclearization of North Korea. So I think from Biden administration point of view, both United States and South Korea implemented what they should do in joint uh, statement of September uh, 19 in 2005, which basically affirms that there's no nuclear weapons in Korean Peninsula, no intention to redeploy nuclear weapons back to South Korean territory. But it, it is North Korea that didn't abide by the agreement made by September 15 in 2005. So by using the term, the denuclearization of DPRK, Biden administration probably think that they have to go from that point, who should do what? So it's going to be then really difficult if Biden administration demand North Korea to agree on the final stage of the denuclearization, then it's going to be the incremental implementation of a comprehension, comprehensive package, then North Korea probably would not be interested in that negotiation. So during, in the, North Korean policy review, I believe that the Biden administration is thinking of how much bargaining power that Biden administrations have compared to like Trump, compared to Trump administration and the Obama administration. And another <clears throat> dilemma that Biden administration has is President Biden refused to have any summit level meeting with the Kim Jong-un. But the problem is that then who can talk about the nuclearization issue with the United States? So ultimately, it's going to be Kim Jong-un who can negotiate on the terms of the denuclearization. But now, unless Kim Jong-un is so confident that he's going to get something that he can talk his people, he's not going to come to the negotiation with uh, President Biden. So now that's another uh, difficulties that the U.S. Uh, is facing. And we discussed that Kim Jong-un come up with the, the abandoning Yangbyon in exchange for the sanctions relief in Hanoi. Uh, but the, my recent uh, talk with someone who's really familiar with the negotiation in 2018 and 2019, the Yongbyon deal was proposed by Kim Jong-un in Singapore. And Trump rejected it right away. And about a, like eight months later, Kim Jong-un proposed the same thing. No changes at all. So I think that that fact also was discussed during the uh, North Korean policy review of Biden administration and that is uh, we, we need to, we are, uh, Biden administration is not going to positively perceive that fact. And I have uh, one question each for both Ken and Vipin. And Ken mentioned that since it's going to be really difficult and maybe the limitation of the political capital of the Biden administration one like low-hanging fruit for Biden administration is 
endorsing inter-Korean dialogue. But uh, as uh, Mason just mentioned that North Korea has refused to engage with South Korea <coughs> because they say that South Korea is only focusing on non-essential matters, which means that North Korea wants to get some important progress in sanctions relief. So Ken, when you say that no, uh, you, uh, Biden administration should consider the endorsing the inter-Korean dialogue, does that include any relief on the like sanctions or like special treatment on the sanctions so inter-Korean dialogue can like make a progress? And Vipin, you mentioned that it's going to be like incremental deal uh, that is realistic, like slowing down, capping, and uh, reversing. Uh, I believe that it, it's going to take quite time. JCPOA took more than two years. So now our government, is, we, we are going to have presidential election in March next year and we are going to have a major parties, presidents or candidate in the fall. So South Korean government political time schedule is very much different from the, the like schedule that you just suggested. So can there be any uh, political consultation between Korea and the US and maybe South Korean government wanted to expedite the process so to expedite the process, what can be done from the U.S. side? Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Woo jung -yum. Finally, uh, uh, we have uh, Professor Jo Dong-jun, uh, Seoul National University. Professor Jo, where are you? Uh, in my office. Unfortunately, I have to teach are, in the afternoon, yeah, so I have to stay here. You are office in Waikiki, Hawaii? No, no, <laughs> in my office. Okay, uh, thank you for joining us here. Okay, uh, you have seven minutes, please start. Okay, thank you, Chairman, and thank the organizer of this event, and I'd like to thank for the presented, uh, presenters uh, candidate assessment on North Korea's nuclear issue. So to save time, uh, let me ask you two small questions to Professor Naran first. So North Korea has been pursuing tactical nuclear weapons I'm afraid the presence of the North Korea's tactical nuclear weapons would have more destabilizing effect than strategic weapons. So here is my first small question. How does your posture optimization theory explain North Korea's strong interest to seek tactical nuclear weapons? So second question, what impact do you expect North Korea's tactical nuclear weapons would bring upon uh, North Korea's nuclear posture. And also, I have a question to Dr. Gauss, and uh, this question follows uh, Dr. Woo jung question. So the United States gave publicly uh, negative security assurance to North Korea several times, and two Koreas has got an even non-aggression pact. South Korea and the uh, United States uh, tentatively stopped joint nuclear drills. So there have been so many trials to reduce uh, North Korea's security uh, threat. So except for the termination of uh, joint military drill and inter-Korean talk and negative security assurance, what uh, measures would North Korea perceive as a sign of security threat reduction? And more specifically, what measures would the Biden administration would give to North Korea to reduce North Korea's uh, security threat. Uh, thank you. That's it. Thank you for saving time, uh, Professor Cho. <laughs> thank you. All right, okay. Uh, uh, we had uh, two presentations and uh, five uh, discussions. Uh, interesting questions were also raised. Uh, uh, before uh, going back to presenters, uh, let me ask uh, any uh, questions or comment from floor. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, 
All right, then uh, before we go to presenters, let me, let me add uh, you are burdened a little bit, okay? Uh, uh, Director Ken Gauss, you said uh, the Obama administration's wait and see approach did not work very well. Uh, so called st strategic patience did not work. And also, you said uh, Trump administration's top down approach uh, has not been followed by any, any concrete uh, policies. In other words, it didn't, didn't work either, right? So uh, my question will be, uh, what, what, should be what should be the uh, proper uh, approach uh, to the North Korean nuclear uh, issue under Biden administration in your uh, point of view? And also, uh, uh, Professor uh, B.P. Narang, you said uh, North Korea would not denuclearize uh, unilaterally, nor uh, no, uh, voluntarily, right? And also you said North Korea uh, could not be denuclearized by force, right? Then also my question, you know, uh, what should be done uh, toward the North Korean uh, nuclear issue? Uh, also we have to uh, very, we have to be attentive to those conditions between North Korea and United States, they, they, there is almost no confidence uh, between each other. Also, I think uh, uh, between uh, North Korea and the United States, a huge power asymmetry. Uh, the diplomatic negotiations will go smoothly between these you know, uh, two countries under these conditions of uh, no confidence, almost no confidence at all, and uh, very big, you know, uh, power asymmetry between two countries. Okay, uh, uh, let's go back to first, uh, uh, Director Ken Gauss first. Uh, uh, responses raised uh, uh, questions and comment, and then we'll move on, uh, Professor Burpin Narang. All right, uh, Director Ken Gauss. Can you, can you respond, please? Okay. Uh, in terms of Professor Mason's uh, excellent questions, I think that um, he asked whether the Biden administration has fresh eyes. My own opinion is no. I think that there's some debate going on inside the Biden administration between the need for a more nuanced policy uh, with some bold initiatives, but a probably a more prevalent uh, kind of status quo policy. That's why I don't really expect to see much of anything, because as I said in my speech, uh, it's very politically very difficult inside the U.S. body politic to, uh, to do what is necessary in order to get North Korea to the negotiating table, especially early on in the Biden administration. Given the dynamics within the Congress right now, I, I think that's going to be very difficult. So I would actually be, frankly, very surprised if we see anything other than window dressing uh, in terms of changes when it comes to the new North Korea strategy coming out of, mm. out of the Biden administration. Uh, Professor Mason uh, asked about any uh, the policy review insights and what the think tank may think tanks may contribute to that. Frankly, I've been kind of uh, surprised. Well, not really surprised, but this administration has not really reached out to the think tank world in the way that we have seen previous administrations. Part of that could be because of COVID and things like that. It just makes it very logistically very difficult, but I have been involved in, in policy discussions, uh, you know, the think tank and kind of the, you know, uh, the, the worker level within the new administrations in the past, uh, both Republican and Democrat, uh, where think tanks would have some input into that uh, discussion 
I don't see it as much here. Maybe it's because a lot of the people, obviously, in the Biden administration have really recently spent a lot of time in the think tank, so they're carrying that information already in there. Uh, maybe it's because of COVID. Maybe I'm just not being invited to those things because they know that what I'm going to talk about is going to be very difficult for them to do anyway. So probably not a good idea to invite me anyway. Um, let's see. Uh, risk reduction uh, uh, as, uh, can it only mean a freeze? I think the freeze is the easiest way to get to risk reduction. Because if you have, if you basically tell North Korea that it cannot conduct provocations, cannot, uh, you know, proliferate and cannot uh, test, basically you have the, nu North, uh, the nuclear program in a box. I think we can live with it in a box of where it is right now if they're not doing those things, which I think reduces the level of tension. The question is, what are you going to have to put on the table in order to get them to do that? Now, you were talking about my small steps. Um, well, when I'm talking about, you know, the U.S. backing South Korea in the inter-Korean dialogue, I'm not talking about humanitarian aid or things like that. I am talking about major projects between the two countries that basically, and this is basically the way you've got to do it, Money has got to go into the pockets of the North Korean elite. They have got to be able to get a cut of the pie. If they don't get a cut of the pie, they aren't interested in engaging South Korea. So you're going to have to make it worth their while. How you do that, whether you reinvigorate, you know, Mount Kumgon, something like that, it's got to be something significant enough where the North Koreans see a future in it. Handing them out, you know, you know, COVID aid or humanitarian aid or you know, things like that. For the North Koreans, that's peanuts. They're not interested in that. And that is not enough to get them to come to the table. Uh, so how much does the U.S. willing to pay for the, the North Korean nuclear program? Well, do you want it? How much of it do you want? And uh, you're going to probably have to pay a significant price. That probably means you're going to have to roll back the 2016 in 2017 sanctions, at least as a beginning. Remember, the North Koreans right now are using the North nuclear program as the source of legitimacy for the le regime and the supreme leader. You have got to wean them off of that legitimacy toward the economy. So whatever you do has got to be significant enough that over time, you one, build trust, and two, give Kim something that he can hang his hat on in terms of legitimacy in order to start slicing away at that nuclear program. And so it's not going to be quick, even if you offered up all the sanctions relief today. Probably the North Koreans are going to drag their feet. Uh, so you're going to have to be willing to, uh, to probably deal with that. Um, in terms of an incremental process, I think that's absolutely right. You're going to have to build up trust, and that can only come through an incremental process. And North Korea is not going to want to give up a lot of stuff in the beginning. So they're going to want to get some stuff. They give a little bit of stuff, but not irreversible. And, uh, and hopefully we can slowly slice it away that way. Uh, what security guarantees, uh, what does North Korea need? We make a lot out of in terms of security guarantees. At the end of the day, I think the North Koreans know we're not going to attack them. Uh, I think the, the, the sanctions relief is the primary driver into getting into negotiations with the North Koreans. On the back end, yes, you're going to have some security guarantees, uh, but that's going to be built up with trust over time. Uh, just by telling them that, hey, we're never going to attack you. Well, the North Koreans are not going to believe that necessarily. Uh, and so, you know, you're going to have to build up that trust over time. So I see that as a back end of the negotiating process. Uh, and uh, uh, the moderator said uh, that Obama's strategy didn't work, Trump's strategy did not work, what strategy will work? I would say the Trump strategy and the Obama strategy were about the same thing. Uh, they were about strategic patience, maybe a little bit more maximum pressure on the Trump side. You need to be able to give some carrots on the front side 
and back away from some of this pressure in order to get North Korea invested in the process. The idea is to get them invested in the process so that you begin to have leverage over North Korea. Right now, we have absolutely no leverage over North Korea. You build up that leverage, then you can start to ask for things that you want. Thank you. Thank you, Director Ken Gauss. Uh, thank you for your answers. All right, uh, Professor uh, B.P. Narang, can you start, please? Yeah, thank you. Thanks for all the questions. I won't get to all of them um, because there were, there were quite a few. Um, so let me try and answer as many as I can sort of, uh, you know, at the 30,000 foot level. Um, you know, the United States has spent a quarter, had spent a quarter century trying to prevent North Korea from developing and acquiring nuclear weapons. It failed. And now the challenge is, you know, how do you manage a new nuclear weapons power? That sort of, to get to Mason's excellent question, what does theory tell us and, you know, our, the historical record tell us about how we manage new nuclear weapons powers? There's only been several cases of this, adversarial to the United States and the Western alliance. China is really the best example. Neither the United States nor the Soviet Union wanted China to get nuclear weapons in 1964. It did, and then it grudgingly sort of accepted and then legally recognized China as a nuclear weapons power with the NPT. And China's acquisition of nuclear weapons reoriented American nonproliferation policy for other states, but China became accommodated into the nuclear regime. Eventually, North Korea, so long as Kim maintains power or you know there there isn't massive domestic political upheaval in North Korea is going to retain a nuclear weapons capability the only state that has given up its nuclear weapons as i noted voluntarily was south africa and that was due to massive regime upheaval uh, and it's possible that north korea eventually evinces some of the same sort of variables that south africa did when it relinquished nuclear weapons it's not there today and the cases of Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Ukraine, which inherited Soviet nuclear weapons and then surrendered them back, really don't apply to an indigenous nuclear weapons program. So I think the, the sort of the, the, the theoretical question is how have we managed new nuclear weapons powers in the past? And how can we manage sort of North Korea's emergence as a nuclear weapons power? North Korea and Kim Jong-un don't want to deal with sort of these, this nuclear question now that it's out of the barn, they have nuclear weapons indefinitely. And I also think U.S. policy at some point can't continue to focus on disarming North Korea when it already has a credible nuclear weapons capability, right? <laughs> North Korea needs to move on, and frankly, we need to move on, right? And this may affect how we approach other states. Um, I think sort of the disappointing uh, lesson of the North Korea, the quarter century North Korea saga is that we're rerunning the same movie with Iran right now in the United States. And I think, you know, the, the sort of, um, the, the, the sequencing problems that, that, uh, tr torpedoed the agreed framework in, in 1994, we're sort of, sort of seeing the same sort of domestic political and sequencing problems, uh, stymie the U.S. and Iran from getting back to the JCPOA today also. And I think, you know, we're going to rerun the same movie, I think, with Iran if we don't get back to the JCPOA relatively quickly, and there, that window is closed. So the, the question is, how do we best manage the fact that North Korea grudgingly managed, fine, whatever you have to tell yourself politically, uh, you know, to, to, to move on, how do you manage a nuclear North Korea? And, you know, I think this is why the emphasis that both Ken and I and others, like Ankit uh, Panda, my uh, longtime friend and co-author, uh, James Acton, George Perkovich, you know, uh, Gene Lee, Eric Brewer, they have an article in Foreign Affairs Today about essentially this concept of risk reduction, right? How do you reduce the chance that a nuclear weapon is used? How do you reduce the chance that it is sold or exported? And how do you reduce the chance of conflict? And, you know, this is a broad paradigm. I think a lot of the specifics are to be worked out. But once the mindset shift is, has, has occurred between disarmament 
to management and risk reduction, uh, then I think their meaningful objectives can be can be made. Um, so that's number one. Number two is this issue of North Korean nuclear strategy. And this gets a little bit more to the specifics. So, you know, in, in, in again, when you think about theory, North Korea's security challenges, it faces a conventionally superior Western alliance on its border, right? South Korea and the United States. And this, this whole idea of, you know, tactical or battlefield nuclear weapons and as, the asymmetric nuclear strategy, mm-hmm. as I term it, is to threaten first use against sort of the threat of a, a conventional invasion or an actual conventional invasion to slow it down and then use the ICBMs in reserve to deter nuclear retaliation. This is a straight out of NATO playbook, straight out of the Pakistani and French playbook. Uh, it is sort of a tried and tested nuclear strategy. So one avenue to push on is, you know, it, this is where I think, uh, I think it was Mason uh, pointed out. We have to also think about North Korea. Maybe North Korea is not interested in talking about capping any of the, the, the capabilities that it has not yet achieved, that it needs to fill out this strategy, right? I think North Korea wants to maintain a minimum capability to be able to hold at risk and stymie the conventional invasion. It needs to be able to hit certain targets in the region. It needs to be able to hit Guam, and it probably needs to retain a capability to hit the United States. Does it need the, the liquid fuel missiles once it has solid fuel missiles? Probably not. When I talk about excess capabilities, I'm talking about sort of the first generation capabilities that North Korea develops in order to buy the insurance, but then develops better systems like solid fuel systems. Uh, and then you can you can talk about doing what other states have done, which is sort of relinquish the, the, the liquid fuel capabilities because you have the solid fuel capabilities to replace them. But at, at the end of the day, North Korea has sort of envisioned a nuclear strategy and the, the KN-23 variant we saw today was part and parcel of that strategy. It is essentially a short-range, nuclear-capable, solid-fuel missile that is very, very capable and, frankly, scary if I'm you know, South Korean or uh, you know, in, in, uh, in the region because it is designed to evade missile defenses. And now, if it can carry a 2.5-ton warhead that lays to, you know, any, it lays to rest any doubts that it's nuclear-capable because... You know, if North Korea can't design a 2.5-ton nuclear warhead at this point, then uh, you know it's it's uh, it's unlikely that they wouldn't be able to do that. So, you know, the, these systems, at the especially at the shorter range, North Korea may still be developing, uh, and it may still want a solid fuel ICBM. So, when we talk about the you know the, the question about the timeline uh, came up, it's possible that North Korea is really not interested in rolling back or capping its nuclear capabilities, especially its missile capabilities at the moment. Uh, and it may not work with the timeline for the South Korean domestic political calendar. Uh, but there's a world in which maybe North Korea says, I have enough fissile material. I have enough fissile material for sort of the number of warheads I need. And I don't really need that many warheads. Uh, that becomes a management challenge too. So it, it's worth, I think, pushing on what doors North Korea is willing to sort of give up if it's willing to slow down fissile material production. Not even stop fissile material production, but if you if you shutter Yongbyon, you starter you starve the program of its only known source of plutonium and tritium, and that really shapes the future composition of the force if they're if they're pushed entirely into uranium. And so, if that's something North Korea is willing to put on the table, that's absolutely a door we should push on, uh, and that would have a meaningful sort of reduction and slowdown and, and shape the future composition of the force in ways that reduces risk. So there, there are doors, I think, that can be pushed on uh, to slow the, the growth of the program before talking about caps, freezes, uh, and reversals. Uh, and so, you know, I think that there is, um, uh, there, there, there is an envisioned strategy that North Korea has. It's not an irrational strategy. It's one that NATO has adopted. It's one that Pakistan has adopted. Uh, and it's really designed to deter a superior conventional power uh, and defeat that conventional power if necessary, holding at risk uh, assets in the region and then holding the ICBMs in reserve, using ambiguity, deception, numbers, uh, and survivability uh, through relatively cheap means to do so. Uh, and you know, I think that's sort of where North Korea is at. And you know, it's worth pushing on what doors it's it's willing to open. But uh, it may be the case that it hasn't fully filled out its strategy, so it may not it may not be willing to put much on the table.
But we won't know that unless we get them to the table. There was this question about sole purpose that I want to address because I think this will end up, you know, being potentially a debating point uh, in the Biden administration's nuclear posture review. Um, and I think, as, as Professor Kim pointed out, I, I, uh, Ankit Panda and I wrote this recent article in War on the Rocks. It's freely available online. Anybody wants to read it. Uh, that interrogates sort of the sole purpose formulations. And our, our basic objective in, the, um, in this article was to note and try to convince readers that most sole purpose formulations, and in theory, sole purpose is distinct from no first use. There's often a conflation that sole purpose is the same thing as a no first use declaration. It is not. A no first use declaration is an explicit employment constraint that the United States will not use nuclear weapons first under any circumstance. And you can litigate what first use means and you know, there, there's whether it's preemption, uh, whether preemption is allowed, but primarily no first use is an employment constraint. Sole purpose is a philosophical statement about why the United States possesses nuclear weapons. And if the United States possesses nuclear weapons to deter nuclear attacks against the United States or its allies, it does not prevent the United States from necessarily using nuclear weapons first if it's in the service of deterring nuclear use against the United States or its allies. There are other formulations that are broader. For example, the, United, the sole purpose of U.S. nuclear weapons is to deter nuclear attacks or other existential attacks, maybe chemical or biological or maybe cyber against U.S. or its allies. So a lot turns on the formulation, but the basic, I think, reassurance point is that the allies should not believe, and I, I think should not argue, that a sole purpose formulation is necessarily the same thing as no first use. There are some that get pretty close. I mean, I think President Biden, when he was vice president, used the formulation, um, the sole purpose is to uh, deter and, if necessary, retaliate against nuclear attacks against US or its allies. And that comes much closer, I think, to no first use, uh, a no first use declaration than uh, other sole purpose formulations. But uh, the, the, the basic, I think, thrust of that article was to try to convince, uh, you know, especially allied capitals um, that a sole purpose formulation or declaration is not the same thing as no first use. Uh, there's no reason to freak out if sole purpose does come down the pipeline. Uh, it is a narrower, I think, formulation of calculated ambiguity. It leaves open enough daylight for potential first use in extreme and existential circumstances, uh, and you know that's that's the way I think it should be. It should be litigated on its own terms, uh, not because of this sort of conflation with no first use. So I'll stop there, um, and uh, I think uh, we may have time for further questions or comments, and mm. look forward to it. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor uh, Nara. Your your point, uh, less production paradigm, less production as a, uh, it could be a meaningful uh, objective or it could be a practical goal. Uh, however, the less production uh, would be very hard for Korean people, majority of Korean people to accept, especially the conservative uh, point of view, they are not going to accept uh, the goal of less production. All right. Okay, uh, anyway, uh, uh, among our uh, discussant, if you have any further comment or questions to the presenter's responses, uh, please. All right, Professor Mason Rich. Okay, um, just to, again, just a few small, well, I guess sort of two, two observations and then maybe one question. Um, I mean, I think that Director Gauss began to, to get to this a, a little bit, um, or, or maybe between the lines actually quite substantially, but without saying it as directly as I'm going to, but you know, one of the fundamental problems is that the United States is politically broken, um, and you know I don't think we talk enough about that in these fora, to be honest with you. You know, and I I heard, you know, I just heard 
Professor Narang say these wonderful things which sound utterly plausible to me and with which I'm largely in agreement and seem very reasonable and moving forward, you know, cutting your losses and, you know, doing the best you can with the situation that you're in. And I just think to myself, you know, that's a wonderful definition you gave us of excess capability. So, for instance, giving away, you know, the first generation uh, weapon systems, you know, the, the liquid fueled uh, and that type of thing. And I'm just in my head when I hear you say that, I'm like, yeah, okay, that seems, that seems reasonable. Like, what price do we have to pay for that? And then I think to myself, can you imagine the headlines on Fox News or on National Review? I mean, you know, the JCPOA was a pretty good deal, and it just got absolutely slaughtered by the conservative press. Can you imagine the headline on Fox News? You know, Joe Biden pays gazillions of dollars to North Korea for obsolete systems. Meanwhile, they hang on to their, you know, solid fuel systems. I mean, the U.S. is so politically broken right now that, you know, even great ideas, even brilliant ideas just don't seem like they have the chance of seeing the light of day. And, and you know, I hate to be so pessimistic, but like that's the fundamental problem, at least on the US side of the equation, when we talk about what a strategy might look like vis-a-vis -vis North Korea. I can compare that, by the way, to something, I mean, it's not perhaps as acute here, maybe it is, it sort of depends, I guess, but you know, Moon Jae-in isn't gonna be in office forever, right? He has T minus one year and X days. And for those of you in the US who haven't been paying attention to the land scandals and all the things that are going on here, uh, it's not like the progressive government is doing particularly well at the moment. They're, they're suffering badly in the polls. Um, and you know, there's no guarantee that you're going to see a progressive government come in uh, next year. And that's going to change the equation too. Because you know what the Moon Jae-in administration is interested in is going to be vastly different than you know what a conservative administration would be interested in here in Korea. So you know, if the strategy that the, that the Biden administration comes up with even seems plausible uh, at the you know, U.S. domestically as well as in South Korea, you know in a year and X days, it might all of a sudden not seem very plausible anymore. Um, and I just throw that out as a second monkey wrench um, in the in the story. Uh, and then I have one question, I guess, for, for Professor Narang again. Um, you know, as we're seeing North Korea's arsenal, nuclear weapons arsenal, become more um, sophisticated, um, how does that impact um, their ability to manage their nuclear weapons? Um, my, my friend Dan Pinkston refers to the, the, the shift here as uh, in North Korea, in terms of a nuclear arsenal, you know, away from a mom and pop shop and into something you know more, um, more sophisticated, particularly with respect to, to something like command and control. So, like as their arsenal becomes more sophisticated, like how does that um, play into to the the way that their command and control has to 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 stay current with the um, actual you know systems capabilities, and as a sort of you know bank shot off of that, what does that do? to um, you know, US military strategy vis-a-vis uh, -vis the North Korean uh, arsenal and uh, in particular deterrence. Mm -hmm. How does that affect the US's deterrence mm -hmm. of North Korea? All right, thank you, Professor Mason Ritchie. Uh, Professor So, John Gun. Um, just, just quickly, I'm, I'm, uh, I think uh, one of the main questions we have dealt with during today's panel is about, is the question about whether Biden has fresh eyes. And I'm very interested in that question because I'm studying American foreign policy and American politics. And I'm, I, I totally agree with Ken because if, I, if I'm looking at President Biden himself, I'm very, very pessimistic. Uh, I watched him uh, delivering his first ever press conference uh, today in the Eastern Time, and in response to a North Korea question, uh, he was kind of almost reading the script. Maybe he was kind of, uh, sounded like he was looking for kind of UN Security Council number 1718. Uh, but in any case, I mean, he even did not enjoy the follow-up question uh, by the reporter. I mean, he's kind of very short answer, oh, yes. So, I mean, if you look at Biden himself, I mean, I mean, it's kind of pessimism still here. But if you look at his advisors and even his uh, party coalitions, I think there is some kind of changing kind of environment 
uh, there. And, uh, and in addition to that, I, I truly understand and uh, uh, sort of uh, be empathetic with uh, Biden. If uh, Biden has too much on the plate for now, uh, during his first year, he has, I mean, the COVID relief package and immigration, gun debate, infrastructure. So if he is uh, uh, waking up tomorrow morning and he is talking about North Korea, then he might turn out to be a kind of out of touch president for the American public. So that's kind of truly understandable. But I guess uh, that's why, uh, one of the reasons why, to kind of ironically speaking, uh, the Biden administration should uh, provide some sort of com comprehensive plan so that the ball uh, should be in North Korea's court, or the ball should remain in North Korea's court for the time being. So I, I guess kind of I, maybe this is my wishful thinking, but I hope that this time should be different from the past. Like in the past, US pro I did North Korea provocations and US response and then the problem of sequencing and commitment, that's what we have uh, seen before. That's the kind of movie we have seen many, many, many times. So this time, I really hope that the, um, the Biden administration should uh, offer some fresh look and fresh eyes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, during your discussion, Professor Sojung-gun, you raised a very interesting statistical uh, uh, conclusion, right? Uh, I, I hope you, that statistical conclusion would uh, realize uh, in the coming years. Uh, still, I think we have uh, about, about three minutes left. Uh, either uh, direct can House or purpose, uh, Bifin, if you have anything left to talk, uh, I will give you one minute. <laughs> Any of you? Yeah. Okay. Uh, one question. One question that I missed uh, was about uh, North Korean internal politics uh, or changes uh, that I mentioned. Uh, there's a lot going on inside North Korea right now around the Supreme Leader in terms of how authority is being uh, managed within the regime, accountability is being raised within the regime. A lot of this is to start to set the, the environment for North Korea to eventually engage somewhere down the, few, uh, down the way. Uh, authority is being pushed down the chain of command, especially within the economic organs. And even though they're having to rely more on um, centralized planning now because of the the uh, self-sufficiency uh, strategy that they have going on in this period of COVID, I think they do want to move toward being a more normalized state at some point. What that means in its entirety, there's still going to be an authoritarian slash totalitarian state, but I think it will be somewhat different. And I think that they will be looking for economic expertise, as well as I said, economic resources coming into the country. Uh, we have an opportunity to take advantage of that if we can get off of this obsession about denuclearization on the front end. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Director Ken House. Uh, Professor Vivian Narang, do you have any 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 talks left? Yeah, I want to. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, please I, go ahead. I, I think I think Mason's point is really important, and I want to. Should probably close all my optimism from the. I'm not a particularly optimistic person in general. But what I am pessimistic about is U.S. politics, and especially, um, you know, when it comes to our ability to credibly commit international negotiations, because we can no longer essentially ratify treaties. So the, the composition of the Senate makes it impossible for the president um, to be able to submit a treaty to the Senate and have it ratified. Uh, and that is a structural problem, and we saw the, the, the consequences of, and that the bill came due when the Trump administration ripped up the JCPOA. The JCPOA was an executive agreement. Any agreement with North Korea would have to be an executive agreement. And it is not unreasonable for Iran today or North Korea tomorrow to wonder how credible American commitments are when they can be ripped up uh, in the next administration. And this is a very real problem. I think that this is, um, this, 
this makes the negotiating space very difficult because the the uh, counterparty, Iran or North Korea, has to hedge against that possibility and uh, increase its demands or build in safeguards to protect against future uh, U.S. abrogation of those of those commitments. Uh, and so I'm not optimistic, actually, that you know that there's going to be a long-term solution in the Biden administration. There, there may be short-term solutions, but even those short-term solutions, as you know, Mason rightly pointed out, uh, can mobilize Fox News. And you know, in a world in which Fox News is is increasingly slightly right of center, because the really right of center is, you know, these online media news companies that. Uh, you know, spin conspiracy theories. Um, it's it's going to be difficult for a Biden administration uh, to take that incoming fire, uh, quite literally. So um, after, you know, what I thought was generally optimistic for me, uh, that is a very real source of pessimism uh, in the United States, uh, you know, or in terms of how an international negotiation would unfold and how credible it would be. So on that pessimistic note... <laughs> Thanks, uh, thanks for having me. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Bipin Narang. Well, uh, about four years ago, when Trump administration just launched in Washington, D.C., we had a similar uh, discussions at the time. And uh, most of participants at the time, we were very enthusiastic and we were very optimistic about the nuclearization of, of Korean Peninsula. And when uh, Trump and Kim Jong-un, uh, when they agreed something in Singapore, we were very you know, optimistic uh, because they, I think they agreed very important uh, goals, uh, complete denuclearization of Korean Peninsula and diplomatic normalization between two countries and uh, a permanent peace regime on the Korean Peninsula and improvement of inter-Korean relations. They agreed a very important final goals uh, for the peace uh, on the Korean Peninsula. So at the time, I was very optimistic and uh, you know, uh, my enthusiasm, I thought my enthusiasm will come true very soon, but still, you know, uh, as both of you uh, discussed, presented very well today, uh, nothing has been followed. So I decided I am not going to be optimistic anymore. <laughs> However, I am not going to be pessimistic either, <laughs> right? Uh, let's wait and see what's going to happen in the future. Uh, thank you so much for uh, both presenters. I think uh, we are expecting lunch now, but you have to go to bed now, now right? Uh, thank you so much, both uh, presenters from United States. And also, thank you very much for our excellent uh, discussion. Uh, thank you. Let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, this was the first panel, and we will have a one-hour luncheon break, and then we will come back to 1 p.m. Korea time for the second panel. The second panel will start at 1 p.m. Thank you. See you soon. Okay. <laughs>